This week, the plant with a secret in its seeds, a plane that can fly itself, and dinner is served. And it is an acquired taste. In the middle of the otherworldly landscape of Iceland, something strange is going on. 130,000 barley plants are slowly making their way from one end of this greenhouse to the other. And what's even stranger is what this barley is going to be used for. It is in the food chain, but it's not food for us, and it's not food for animals. No, this is something much, much weirder than that. This grass is a host. It's been genetically modified to carry a special protein called a growth factor in its seeds. Once the plants reach the end of their journey, these seeds are harvested, milled and purified, and the resulting growth factor protein can be used to help produce something very unexpected. Meat in a lab without the animals. I think we've reached the point where it's not like nice to have. I think it's we have to have it. The, the earth is not going to grow. We're not going to get uh, more agriculture area. The population is rising uh, and we have to feed all of the people. The argument for growing meat in labs without living animals is that the process will eventually require less land, less energy and produce less harmful waste. And it takes more agricultural land to uh, grow feed for the animals that we eat. We are essentially bypassing that. So uh, we don't have to kill all of these animals. We just have to take uh, the stem cell from them. And uh, I think this is a more viable and more environmental, uh, much better option. Companies using cow stem cells to make lab-grown beef burgers and even lab-grown steak are already trying out growth factors made here in Iceland. And although the first ever growth factors came from animals, it's hoped that this barley plant method will be cheaper and scalable because nature can do a lot of the heavy lifting. But at the moment, research is still ongoing to come up with the barley that produces the very best growth factors, which is why the volcanic and geothermal peculiarities of Iceland are an ideal place to experiment with different growing conditions. They're growing the barley in this, which is volcanic pumice from Mount Hecla, which is somewhere over there. The good thing about pumice is it is inert, so it doesn't really release any nutrients into the plants itself. And that means these guys can completely control the nutrient mix that the barley gets. We are here in a high-tech greenhouse that is using geothermal energy for heating and for the electricity. We are using hydroponic cultivation. The computer decides when to open windows, when to turn off and lights, when to pump in CO2, uh, what nutrition to feed these plants and so forth. But eventually, these carefully programmed plants will have to be harvested in regular fields to produce enough growth factor for a global lab-grown meat industry. And barley specifically has been chosen because it can grow in many different climates and it also doesn't cross-pollinate with other plants around it. The typical farm in Iceland, which is about 150 hectares, could actually produce about 10,000 tonnes of meat. That's if lab-grown meat is indeed the answer. After all, aren't we all supposed to be eating more greens? Well, not too far away, another company is tapping into Iceland's geothermal power to put us on an altogether different diet. This is food for us, or at least it will be one day. It's not something we're currently used to eating, mind you, but tastes change. It's algae. 
I know, sounds kind of yeah, doesn't it? But the microalgae growing in these test units are rich in protein and omega-3, much more so than traditional crops grown in a field. And they also consume way fewer natural resources too. In these systems, we can grow uh, a ton of protein and using three, four, five hundred times less water and 14, 15 hundred times less land than the best thing that we know today. And in fact, because algae is a plant, it has another environmental benefit, photosynthesis. We get the, the CO2 from the power plant, we get that into our system, we use algae to actually fix that CO2 into biomass, and they breathe out oxygen. So oxygen is actually our only byproduct of this product. Which is not a bad byproduct, really. Uh, the health authorities don't seem to mind. <laughs> so right here in geothermal Iceland, where electricity and hot water are both essentially clean, green and on tap, growing this algae ends up being carbon negative. It pulls more CO2 out of the environment than the electricity puts back in. But in order to feed the world, these algae farms would need to be placed around the globe. And not everywhere is on top of a volcano. The system itself is always carbon negative because we take in CO2, we fix it in biomass and we breathe out oxygen. But if you're having to use electricity that's generated through coal, uh, then exactly. you're, the, the, the system is generating CO2 as well. And then yes, you can connect yes. the pipe from the power station straight back into the algae, suck it back in? That, that is actually a possibility. Yeah. This is what we're doing right now. These guys, they need CO2. So we could actually take whatever CO2 into the system, theoretically. And in fact, Vaxa is thinking even further ahead than just improving the environment here on Earth. Growing food in small spaces with limited water and producing oxygen as a byproduct sounds like a pretty useful thing to be able to do, I don't know, in a moon base or on Mars. If the colonists can stomach it, that is. All right, let me ask you a question. What does algae taste like? Uh, basically the medium it's in. So okay. this, this algae is a cold seawater algae. Salty oh. then. So it's salty. Yeah. Uh, the problem is this one is fairly robust. It's called nanochloropsis. So By fairly robust, you mean a tough chew? It's a tough chew, <laughs> yeah it is. OK, I've been made an offer that I can't refuse. Kitty said, would you like to drink some algae? Of course I would. Oh my life! For real or? Okay, I, I can do it you first. Know, you're not having a laugh. I can do it first. Yeah, it's fishy. Yeah. Needs a little um. What's it called? A lie down afterwards. That's it. Okay. <laughs> mm, maybe it will take a more creative chef than me to be able to sell this straight onto the plate. Nobody's going to eat algae paste, green goo. So that's not the idea. What we are doing here is we are growing the crop and then we're going to use this crop to make food. Because you get soy based stuff, don't you? you exactly. Know, and but you can make it's it into not anything. like you're taking the soy plant and you're eating it. Yeah, yeah. You take the bean. You extract the protein and then you make stuff out of the protein. See, I've solved your problem for you. You know in posh restaurants, yes. you have your, your, your main course and you have it in a red wine jus, okay. which is basically just gravy. You need to call this algae. Algae? And then you can charge like 100 pounds per plate. I like it. Hello, here's your tech news roundup. It was the week that Douyin, China's version of TikTok, announced it will limit the use of the platform for users under 14 to 40 minutes per day. The EU has proposed a common charger for mobile phones, tablets and headphones, imagine that. And streaming service Netflix has bought the rights to all of Roald Dahl's books. 
and a week after Apple showed off the new iPhone 13 and Watch Series 7, it was Microsoft's turn to tempt us with their shiny wares at their Surface event. The company promised its most powerful Surface Pro device ever, the new Surface Pro 8, a new Surface laptop, and also hyped up a new iteration of its foldable phone called, wait for it, the Surface Duo 2. Students from the Netherlands have set off on a 3,000 km road trip in what they claim is the world's first self-sustaining house on wheels. The concept home has an array on its roof that harvests energy to power the vehicle, making it fully self-sufficient. They're taking part in the European Solar Tour, which aims to raise awareness of the need for sustainable travel. And finally, NASA has chosen the site for its moon rover landing near the moon's south pole. The Viper mission, slated for 2023, will attempt to find water ice on the western side of the Nobile crater. The moon's south pole is actually one of the coldest parts of our solar system. I'm looking forward to seeing the dark side of the moon. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? It's a bird plane. I'm at a maritime innovation hub in Reykjavik and I'm being taught how to command the silent flyer. Flapping a bird drone. It's right now. It's, it's kind of really relaxing just watching it. Oh yeah. <laughs> Engineer Peter Hurler, helped here by daughter Clara, is the technical lead behind a very different and quiet kind of drone, one that emits less than 70 decibels. Why have you built a bird drone? Surveillance, where it's um, important to not have an intrusive device, but something that is quite, uh, uh, can be obscured and can hide within a flock of birds. Like if you are thinking of uh, wildlife monitoring, of course we have had inquiries also from the uh, defence sector. By mimicking nature, it's hoped that this drone will be able to flap by unnoticed. Actual in-air tests aren't scheduled though until next summer. So it might be a little while before this bird starts to fly, but in the skies above San Francisco, there is an aircraft which is currently flying itself. And on board is Cody Godwin. The streets of San Francisco are home to many self-driving cars, so naturally the sky above the city is home to a self-flying plane. This is X-Wing, a company that has developed an autonomous flying system that handles everything from taxiing to takeoff to landing to parking. The system is similar to self-driving cars and uses a lot of the same tech like LiDAR, cameras, and sensors to navigate the skies, while a command center on the ground helps the autonomous system communicate with the humans in air traffic control. And now that I'm suited and booted, let's see this thing in action. So this is basically a beta version of what they're working on, which means it'll always require a safety pilot on board. But the company is working to be entirely autonomous, meaning none of these, by the end of next year. And they're also hoping to get FAA certification in 2024. All that the human pilot on board has to do is physically turn the plane on, check that all systems are go, and press the button that activates the autonomous system. Then it's up to the plane. It does have to liaise with a human in the ground control center while it's making its way to the runway for takeoff, but that's just to ensure it's safe to cross certain parts of the strip. During takeoff, it's almost like a ghost is in control because all of the parts are still moving, but I'm not seeing what's moving them. Once you've trained the robot once, you can build as many robots as you want. They all do the same thing, right? Yeah. Some of what the sensors and cameras are picking up is augmented over a real-time view from three cameras mounted on the exterior of the plane. The purplish bits off to the side are other planes that are in the area, while the bluish colored lines in front of the plane are the flight path. On our way back to base, the team decided to let me fly the plane. So we're taking control of the airplane. Okay. So he's out of the loop because he doesn't know what you're doing. All right. So I don't know what I'm doing. Perfect. After a quick lesson on an Xbox controller, I was flying a plane for the first time ever. Sure, I was just controlling the direction and the altitude, but it was a lot of fun. They even let me go as far as a 45 degree tilt. 
Airplanes have been equipped with autopilot systems for years already, but the system X-Wing has developed takes that to the next level. If I was just a passenger in this plane, I would have never known it was being flown autonomously. The ride, takeoff, and landing were as smooth as any other flight I've been on. A lot of what makes that smooth flight possible is the control room. X-Wing's goal is to eventually have one person overseeing a fleet of flights and translating any instructions from the humans in air traffic control to the computers flying the planes. This particular plane took its first autonomous flight in December of 2019, and since then X-Wing has been building up the capabilities of the systems since. Right now, they're planning to use the systems to transport cargo. The next step for that is to really fly uh, commercially uh, unmanned, so no one on board the aircraft, but over unpopulated areas. Uh, so uh, if you're flying cargo, you're not putting anybody's uh, life in jeopardy on, on board the aircraft. And if you're flying over uh, deserted or unpopulated areas, you're also not putting anybody on the ground in jeopardy. The company also sees their systems as a way to make the entire process more cost effective. This is relatively uncharted territory, but to make it even this far has proved to the Federal Aviation Authority that it is possible, and more importantly, it's safe. I've always wanted to get a pilot's license, but maybe tech like this means I won't ever need to. But it's still likely a ways off before we see widespread adaptation and FAA approval of unmanned aircrafts. Drones built at this country house in Chichester don't just hover above the backyard. A groundbreaking new license means pilots can fly these aircraft from hundreds of miles away. Typically, drones are not allowed to be flown outside of the line of sight of their operator. And even when this does happen, regulators only give permission for specific flights on a specific date and for a specific cause. That could all be about to change. A company based here has just been granted the UK's first ever blanket license to make beyond line of sight flights at a moment's notice. The pioneering first flights also rely on autonomous systems. Our system maps the world in 3D in real time, understands that 3D world and its position in that world. That can allow the pilot to stand back, to give instructions, stand back and, and observe. So this is the 3D model that the drone's building up. Well, it's mapped the house already. And the, the drone's going to turn and the camera's going to go and look at that oh, car. Oh, cool. You can do that on anything, so we can go and have a look at those trees over there. What's the difference between flying it from in here remotely and without the line of sight than it would be if you were stood outside? For example, if you're flying on an oil rig mm. or you're flying on a long piece of infrastructure, you don't have to keep walking along uh, and looking at the drone as you move. You don't need to have a trained pilot travelling to each site. They could be in a nice, quiet office like this, focused on what they're doing without the distraction of the wind and the rain. Drones fitted with cameras or sensors are particularly useful at locations that are difficult or dangerous for humans to be. Parts of Sellafield Nuclear Power Plant and the UK's high-speed rail network have already been surveyed from afar. 40 miles away, remote-controlled drones are also helping Skanska construction with renovations in Surrey. Beyond visual line of sight gives us the opportunity to uh, have fewer people on site, fewer people is less risk. Which is, a, which is a massive plus in busy construction sites. Um, the capabilities of it mean we can cover larger areas quicker, and it's also more reactive. Being able to set a certain task and check a beam, or check a concrete finish, or, or check, just check the view from, uh, from above is, is really key. Later down the line, drone delivery of medicine or online shopping may have the bigger impact on our day-to-day -day lives but industrial sites are a great place to prove these systems are safe. I really want to press it, I, I won't. If the pilot on the ground control station becomes incapacitated for any reason, then somebody coming to their aid simply needs to press that button and the drone comes home and lands itself safely. Seas.ai, along with Amazon, Boeing and Volocopter, are also working with the UK's aviation regulator, shaping rules that may one day permit drones to transport human passengers. The software doesn't know if it's carrying a camera or it's carrying a, a human in a drone taxi. We'll start with simpler use cases. We'll end up with um, Jetsons flying, flying cars. After I go on a simulator, I don't think I should be flying any precious cargo. I mean, I don't think I'm going to be coming for anyone's jobs anytime soon, but I'm actually quite nervous, even though I know this isn't real. <laughs> I'm going to try and get it through here without crashing, and I'm... Uh... It shouldn't crash into anything. <laughs> 
A mm, bit more practice needed there, I think, Paul. And on a similar theme, let's talk about how your deliveries are going to be dropped off in the future. Will it be by drone, by cute delivery bot, or still by an overworked human driver? Well, Omar Metab has found a way to combine all three. The Academy of Robotics have created Cargo, a self-driving electric delivery vehicle. Yes, it's fully road legal and houses 12 cameras and a number of sensors to tell where it's going. Not to mention it features a slew of solar panels to constantly power and charge it up. Now in this version of Cargo, there's space for an operator who's there to make sure everything's running well during a drive. And that will eventually be phased out once they're able to remotely connect to the car with confidence. But even so, the company says it only takes one pass through an area before Cargo learns it. And then it can drive around comfortably with no help. We're told this thing can deliver up to 48 packages a day and hit up to 60 miles an hour. But we won't see that speed here as we follow it through a local neighborhood during its trial run. It just looks like a really small racing car, like an Aerial Latin, but with just a whole load of green plasticky trim on it. But I guess it doesn't really matter about how it looks, it's about how it functions. And right now, it's functioning fine. It's going down the route, it's driving well, it's avoiding the parked cars. It's impressive. It almost looks like someone's driving it. <laughs> it then completed its run of deliveries with no trouble at all. But this isn't the only vehicle they've created. The company needs a command base to control everything from as well. Remotely connect to the car and make sure everything's going all right. Intervene if need be. Well, they put that on wheels too. Inside is a system built to process what their car see in real time. A driving seat so someone can manually take control of a car if need be. And even space for one to be loaded up and moved once it's done. But this was a late innovation. Before anything else, the company spent three years focusing on just the software. Most cars are looking at the road, they look at one giant scene and then try to figure out what everything is doing. But when we are driving as humans, your eyes darting from there to that feature over there, you zoom in a bit, you zoom out and you do all these little things. So we just simulated this in software where we make a cluster of AIs that all do little things and then together they synchronize. And how they train these AIs is not typical either. Instead of gathering tons of data to teach them, the company instead computates scenarios, faking many driving possibilities to teach the car. Now this isn't the only self-driving delivery car out there. Over in the States, Neuro and Refraction AI also have their own vehicles. Quite similar in the way they look, work and drive about like Cargo does. But the company is looking to do more than just deliver to people's homes. We are on the RAF Bryce Norton base, watching as their car delivers items across the massive site. Now, for security reasons, the company couldn't scan the base as it normally would a neighborhood, but they've gotten around that. What they've done is that they've preloaded the bot with pre-existing data about other similar sites and fine-tuned it to this specific setup, like where certain places are and that a traffic light that's green here actually means stop. Weird that, innit? Anyway, that, coupled with the onboard cameras and sensors, means that it can go across the relatively unknown site without any pre-training. So this self-driving car has a lot of promise, potentially the future of delivery for consumers and businesses too. But with humans still needed to be behind the wheel for safety's sake, it may be a while before we see these swarming our roads. And I'm afraid that is it from us here in Iceland. Don't forget that you can find out what we're up to anytime you want on social media. We live on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. <laughs>